am excited because today we get to delve into blood, lymph, and shock. All right, so first what we're going to do is talk about the functions of blood. So the three functions of blood that we have, one is transportation. Basically, it's just being able to act like a cargo, I think of it like a cargo shipping um, system that we have. It takes things from one place to another and drops them off. So for instance, it takes oxygen from the lungs, delivers it to the cells. It picks up waste products at the cells like carbon dioxide as well as other things and takes it back to the lungs to be able to get rid of it. It carries things like from the gastrointestinal system, our digestive tract, um, nutrients that it's collecting from there into our cells. Heat and waste products, it takes those away from our cells to be able to like excrete them through our urine, so it filters it through the kidneys. Um, and then it also helps to transport any hormones that are secreted from many of our endocrine glands to actually get them to the organ that they need to affect. So one of our functions of blood is simply transportation and getting everything moving around the body where it needs to go. Our second function of blood is regulation. It helps to keep things balanced in our body. So for instance, it balances our pH, which is basically the amount of acidicness or alkalosis um, that we have within our system. It also helps to regulate our temperature. So when we are more cold, it will take blood away from our skin and pull it in towards the core of our body to try and increase the warmth there. Or if we're too hot, a way that we can release heat is by actually taking blood and redirecting it towards the skin in order to come in contact uh, through radiation, not in contact, but through radiation, will we'll actually radiate the heat from the blood out into the outside temperature as long as it's at a cooler temperature and less humid than what the environment is around us. It also just helps to adequately um, regulate all of our circulatory fluid. So making sure that we've got enough volume um, and making sure that we're pushing and pulling water where it needs to go so that everything is staying hydrated. So transportation was one, regulation is the second. The third one is protection. It helps us to protect from blood loss, um, all of our clotting mechanisms that we have within the blood. We have light blood cells in our blood as well, which just helps to protect us from any foreign invaders um, and to help deal with any inflammation. We have antibodies that are produced to help to protect us, as well as we have complement proteins to protect us against foreign things as well. So we've got our three function is transportation, regulation, and protection. So just looking at some physical characteristics of blood, it is heavier and thicker than water. It's more viscous. It's got like this um, adhesive or sticky quality. I think of it like if I were to take a drop and rub it between like my first and, and my first finger and my thumb and I were to pull it apart, it doesn't like just splash the way that water does. It actually just has a little bit more thickness to it. It is a slightly warmer than what the body temperature is and it's what brings um, the heat to the different areas of our body. It's at around 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. As far as the pH level goes, it is slightly alkaline. pH is on a scale from 0 to 14, and it's slightly more on that alkal alkaline sign, uh, uh, range of it. Normal range is anywhere between 7.35 to 7.45 for our pH. It accounts for about 8% of our body weight, um, and when we look at the average male versus female, we can see about five to six liters in males versus four to five liters in females. And really primarily that has to do with body size. So what do we find when we look in blood itself? Well, about 55% of it is just plasma, which is the fluid portion of it. Um, then about 45% of it is our formed elements. And we'll go over those in just a little bit. Um, almost all of the formed elements, about 45 uh, of the 45%, are red blood cells. We do have some white blood cells as well as some platelets in there as well. 
So this is just kind of showing you the schematic of what you will see in blood. As we said, the majority of it is plasma, about 90, or excuse me, about 55% of it. And when we look at what is contained within the plasma, the majority of it is just water. We do have some things that travel in the plasma as well. For instance, it is a way that we can transport some gases around the body and then also some other organic molecules, glucose and fats and, and proteins and some waste products. Um, but the majority of it is the fluid. Then as far as the cellular elements, we've got the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And so we're going to go into those formed elements just a little bit. But first, let's talk about the plasma. So when we look at plasma, it's not clear. It actually is a little bit yellowish in color or like a straw colored liquid. It is primarily water, as we said, and then a little bit of solutes. And, you know, we listed some on the last page, but there really are about, a, you know, over a hundred different dissolved solutes that we can find in there. And really the plasma proteins that are floating in there is what role, it plays that huge role in maintaining the proper pressure. Water is drawn towards proteins, and so it'll take um, water out of the tissues and bring it into the bloodstream, and then we can distribute it and make sure we've got fluid going all around the body and that it doesn't accumulate too much outside of the blood vessels. For our formed elements, we've got our red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes. We have so many of them, approximately 5 million per cubic millimeter of blood. I just think about that and appreciate that. Cubic millimeter, tiny, 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 tiny millimeter of blood, 5 million red blood cells. That's huge. They do stay active and viable for about 120 days. That is the normal average lifespan of a red blood cell. That can decrease um, with some pathologies and also the more um, weight-bearing activities you do that are very violent to red blood cells, like running every single time that you're hitting your foot on the ground, that can actually, that foot strike can actually damage red blood cells and make them recycle a little bit more quickly. So you'll find that runners actually tend to produce red blood cells a little bit more than non-runners. They do primarily function to be carry, to carry oxygen. That's really what the main purpose of them is, um, to be able to carry oxygen from the lungs to the body cells. And we'll talk about the process of that as we go throughout the term. So if, when you look at the shape of the red blood cell, it's very interesting. To me, it looks almost like it's a lifesaver with um, a, like a thin middle instead of being a completely a whole. And the reason behind this, although they're very, very tiny, actually our capillaries are even smaller than the diameter of our red blood cells, which means in order for our red blood cells to fit through our capillaries, which are our smallest type of blood vessels, they have to maintain this shape so they can actually fold over on itself. So here I have a, a little video that I wanted to show you, excerpt, um, I kind of spliced two videos together from YouTube and the links are down below in case you wanted to look at them. But I just wanted to show you, when you're looking through, I don't know if you can see this, but you can see how they're deformed as they're moving through. They fit the shape of those capillaries to be able to move through. And that's because they're folding over on each other. And if they didn't have that center that was so thin, they wouldn't be able to do that. Here's a slower picture in which you can actually see them like folded over. To me, they kind of now remind me of the ghosts in Pac-Man as they're floating along. Um, but as soon as they come out on the other side, side of the end of the capillary into the veins, then what we'll see is that they'll pop back in to that circle form. So a couple more things about erythrocytes. Um, to maintain the amounts of them, but just because we do have that turnover, new cells will enter the circulation of about at, or at least 2 million per second. This assures that there's a constant balance between the production and the, and the degradation of those red blood cells. So when we look at it, we've got to be turning over red blood cells continually. Healthy males 
um, as we, when we are talking about how many there were, men tend to have a little bit more than female as far as red blood cells go. So we said 5 million per cubic millimeter of blood. Men are actually a little bit more than that, and females are just a little bit less than that. A lot of that has to do with testosterone, which really helps to simulate the production and creation of erythropoietin, which is the hormone that is responsible for creation, instigating the creation of these erythrocytes. So red blood cells were one of our formed elements. White blood cells are another one. You can see five different types that we have there um, that are circulating within the blood. The primary, the large portion of them are usually neutrophils followed by lymphocytes. Um, and then we also have monocytes that can, um, are, we'll end up looking at monocytes a little bit later um, as we move further in the term. So those are our white blood cells, um, and those make up you know, a, a small percentage of the formed elements. And then our last portion of our formed elements are the platelets. Now platelets are, um, I think of them like, okay, just bear with me. Have you guys ever seen Looney Tunes cartoons in which um, like Elmer Fudd or Bugs Bunny or Daffy Duck, they go back into medieval times and they carry the ball and chain, right? So they have like that ball on the end of the big chain with the stick and they're like swinging it around and it's smooth on all the surfaces of where that ball is, right? And it's just going in and it's like dangerous enough as it is, but it's all smooth. And then all of a sudden it like flips the switch on the stick, like Bugs Bunny does or Elmer Fudd, they flip that switch on the stick and all of a sudden that smooth ball turns to spikes and it's spiky all over the ball and now it's like a real menace right this is the way i think uh, that's how i visualize the platelets they are formed elements that are floating around in our bloodstream and they're smooth and they're able to move in and out of things but when they're activated they all of a sudden will turn spiky and start catching on to each other so as you can see in here, this, this premise of what activates them is actually collagen that's released when we damage the blood vessel. So if we have a rip into the blood vessel, it is now going to expose collagen. Collagen is gonna come in here and it's gonna to start to activate all of our platelets to become sticky in this local area, right? Not the ones that are gonna be swimming by further up or around or further down in the system. It's just in this local area. And then those activation, that activation of those platelets actually continues the activation of more additional platelets. So it kind of just feeds on each other. For those of you who are familiar with it, it's one of the uh, few positive feedback loops that we have within our system. So I have this cool video just to kind of show you guys what this looks like. So here's the platelet, all of a sudden it's crowing across this area, it notices that there's a wound, there's collagen that's being released, it activates this platelet and it actually turns it into what it's called its dendritic form. If you know about neur neurons, it kind of looks like dendrites. Um, and it starts to call more platelets to the area and activates all of these. And it just, they start sticking onto each other. It's like trying to like deal with Velcro that's like sticking to absolutely everything. That's what these platelets are doing. They are congregating in this localized area through a, a variety of different clotting mechanisms. We don't need to know that for now, but they're just being drawn to this area and they're all sticking onto each other. Once that's all laid, fibrin, little fibrin um, fibers, you can see there in the yellow starting to form, will kind of hold everything in place. When that happens, now the platelets will start to degrade over time. When that happens with the degradation, if there's still the cut in the wound, it will still call more uh, platelets to the area to activate them further. However, if the platelets start to degradate and they start to go off into the blood flow and they get recycled um, further along in the body, if the wound is gone, then no, then platelets won't be activated anymore. And so that will just clear the clot away. Okay, so we talked about blood. The other component of our cardiovascular system is our blood vessels. And so we're going to look at arteries, veins, and capillaries. I know we've already talked about them a little bit. We're going to go just in a little bit more detail.
and this one actually has audio. These structures are the arteries, capillaries, and veins. The walls of arteries and veins have three layers. The lining consists of endothelium, a simple layer of cells. The middle layer consists of smooth muscle and elastic fibers. The outer layer is made of connective tissue with elastic fibers. Capillaries have only a single endothelial layer. Blood returning to the heart through the veins after passing through the capillaries is under much lower pressure than the blood flowing in the arteries. Veins have thinner walls with less muscle and elastic tissue than arteries. Valves in the veins are like a one-way street. One-way streets are there to prevent accidents, and valves are there to prevent blood from flowing back. So we want to be able to prevent veins from uh, having blood flow backward. Let's just look at this um, schematic that we have. So here's the heart. Everything that is a blood vessel that is leaving the heart and pumping away from the heart is considered an artery. Everything that is returning to the heart is considered a vein. And that goes the same for whether we're looking at um, in the systemic circulation, around the heart, anything like that. In general, <laughs> in general, our arteries tend to carry oxygen-rich blood, which means it has a lot of oxygen in it. The one exception that we have is the pulmonary arteries because they're going from the heart to the lungs in which they're going to actually pick up oxygen at that time period. So those are our only deoxygenated arteries. And then our veins tend to have more deoxygenated blood flowing in it. So it is, we have dropped off all the nice oxygen out of all of our cells as it's returning back up into the heart and in that flow towards the heart, um, we're looking at uh, the blood that doesn't have a whole lot of oxygen within it. So what we have is leaving the heart, we'll have the aorta, right? And the aortic arch and the, and the abdominal aortas that are coming um, through this, that that's coming through the stomach. Then we go into our smaller arteries, which are our conduction arteries. And then we also have our muscular arteries, also known as our distributing arteries. So it's kind of moving blood different places. And as the arteries become smaller and smaller, they become into arterioles, to a terminal arterial, and then a meta arterial. And then here, joining the veins and the arteries is where our capillaries are. So all of this up through here is really all the larger vessels that we have is just the delivery of blood. That's that cargo shipping system that we have. Here at the level of the capillaries is where we actually have the gas exchange occurring. So we can drop off clean oxygen, pick up all of the waste products, and then it will go back into circulation, traveling through our thoroughfares, our thorough, uh, thoroughfare channels in the, the capillaries leading into the venules. So these are the little small, tiny veins, the venules, and then our small veins, and then our larger veins, and then it goes into the vena cava, superior and inferior, to return back up into the heart. Um, the one thing that I want to note to you guys, because a lot of people tend to think this if you haven't studied the body very much, is that people believe that because of the way things are colored in books, that what we see in arteries, the blood is red, and if you look at your veins, that it's actually blue blood, and that is not true. A lot of the times people say that because when you are looking at like your wrist and you can see those veins in your wrist, they often look blue to purple in color, but that's more the light and the shade of skin um, that you're looking through will appear that way. In fact, all blood in our body is red. It's just brighter red when it's full of oxygen. So you have a brighter red color in the arteries and it's a darker red in the venous system because it's deplete of oxygen. So just keep that in mind that that is not true in case you thought that it was and you can share that with your family because um, most people tend to think that it's blue blood in our veins. So they talked about the one-way valves that allow us to be able to stop blood from flowing backwards. So blood is being pushed 
through the circulatory system, but once it hits the vein, it's not under pressure, which means it's needing just to be a steady flow back up. And when we have this steady flow, it wants to fall with gravity, but as soon as it starts to fall and go back down with gravity, these valves will slam closed so that blood will build up here and not fall back into the previous chamber of it. And then our muscles actually is what acts as our pump to be able to move this blood out of this section of our vein up through this valve to the next one. And then if it starts to drop, it will close that valve and we'll just have more muscle contractions to continue blood. It creates basically a vacuum inside of this vein. When you contract here and push blood out, when the muscles relax, it creates a vacuum. And the, since the blood can't come back down, it has no um, other alternative other than to suck or pull the blood from more inferior into this vein and then travel back into the heart or up towards the heart. So something we need to understand, because it's going to play a role when we start talking about shock, uh, when we start talking about shock, is that we have vascular shunts throughout our body. So we kind of looked at a picture earlier that showed the meta arterial, and this acts as kind of a bypass system for the capillaries when we need to direct blood through the capillaries more quickly. And I'm going to show you. So basically, we have these sphincters or these mus uh, this musculature around our our um, capillaries capillaries that will close off and it'll make blood instead of going into the capillaries scoot through the meta arterial right to the thoroughfare channel so that it can actually move more quickly through those areas and doesn't go to all of the cells around in that area through the capillaries. So here's that example. We have, we just have our artery on the other side, right? So we've got the terminal artery, um, arterial coming here, and then we have the meta arterial coming through here, and it's got this passageway to go all the way through and join back up with the venial. And then we've got the branches of the capillaries all going off um, from the side, branching out from there. Well, we've got these sphincters right here, pre-capillary sphincters which can actually contract down and make it so the blood will not go through these capillaries and we can actually redirect it or we shunt it straight across and through. So I have this picture here with the sphincters closed and constricted and the blood now can move more quickly through this area and isn't going to all of the vascular bed of the capillaries surrounding it. And we'll talk about why that is good for us in a little bit. So as far as where is blood flow in our body, the majority of our blood flow is actually in the venous system because it doesn't have all of that muscular wall like the arteries do. There's a lot of compliance, a lot of stretch that can happen in the venous system. And so blood tends to pool in that venous system, especially if we're not exercising. Um, when we start exercising and contracting those muscles, it helps to push things through a little bit more quickly. The heart arteries, and the capillaries are really only containing about 30 to 35 percent total. Most of it is in the veins. Now, when we have construction, or, or excuse me, constriction of our veins, so remember, we don't have a lot of smooth muscle in them, but we do still have some. So one of the things that we can do when we are needing to reroute blood more quickly is we can actually constrict some of those veins and it can actually really efficiently reroute the blood to other areas. And that is all controlled through our autonomic nervous system. So distribution of blood flow, it goes to different places in the body. Skeletal muscle, um, as far as when we want to increase blood flow to the skeletal muscle, it's because we are doing activity in those particular muscles and it actually causes a vasodilation, which is really stemming from a lack of oxygen. It's utilizing oxygen for muscle contraction in those immediate areas and losing that oxygen and having a lack of oxygen in that immediate area actually acts as a vasodilator and it will pull more blood towards those skeletal muscles. So the more we use our skeletal muscles, the more we're gonna direct blood flow to those particular muscles. If we're not using a set of muscles, so say I was biking, so I'm contracting my legs and using a lot of muscles in my legs, 
but I'm not moving my arms very much, it will actually start to reroute blood and diminish what is going to the non-working muscle to direct it to the legs. So it's going towards the working muscle. It's really kind of fascinating how that works. As far as blood to flow to the brain, no matter what we're doing, it really needs to stay constant. Um, it can't afford to have less blood getting up to the brain because that's how we're delivering oxygen to it. Um, and it really can't increase any flow to the brain because think about how the skull surrounds everything. We cannot afford for excess fluid to be in the brain but not being able to expand because the skull is there that it can actually start to cause some issues. So we actually keep blood flow regulated to the brain staying constant whether we're exercising or laying down or standing up, we try to keep that constant. Skin, we can fluctuate our blood flow based on whether we're trying to warm ourselves up or cool ourselves off. So as we talked about earlier, when we are hot, one way that we can actually release heat is taking our blood, putting it up to the skin surface. So we direct it by vasodilating in the skin and then actually that will radiate out into the cooler temperature around us. Lungs, um, they have a, a, a good portion of our distribution of blood flow as well. When there is less oxygen available in the air, it actually will take the capillaries and the arterioles that are around the um, lungs in the alveoli, which is where the gas exchange happens, and it starts to constrict them because it doesn't want to allow the air in that doesn't have as much oxygen in it. The hard thing is, is that that's great for when there's a disease of some sort happening and there's not enough oxygen getting around because of damage within the lung. What's not good is when we go to altitude and it's happening all throughout the lung, um, in which then it's now vasoconstricting all of that area um, of the blood flow going to the lung to try and um, deal with that lack of oxygen. We'll talk about more on that later in the term. And as far as the heart goes, we will change the distribution of blood flow based on what the heart is doing. It is a muscle. The heart is a muscle. So the more that it works, the more we need to put blood flow to it, right? So um, as far as when the heartbeat is faster, when there's a high myocardial demand um, and the heart rate is increasing, we're going to direct more blood flow to the heart. This just kind of shows you an example of what blood flow is like um, when we are at rest, which is on the left side of the screen, and when we are exercising, which is on the right side of the screen. You can see how changes start to happen. Brain is the same. Remember, as we said, it stays pretty steady. Heart is smaller when we're at rest, but then when we start exercising, we start working the heart more, so we gotta bring more oxygen to it, so it increases. Now look at that jump in skeletal muscle, right? As soon as we start moving and exercising, we are increasing that blood flow to the muscle tremendously. Um, skin will also increase in blood flow because we start to warm up when we are exercising. We need to cool ourselves down so it doesn't cause problems. So we'll bring that, that blood to the skin surface and it'll radi off, radiate off into the air around us. Now we're increasing in the heart, we're increasing in skeletal muscle, and we're increasing in the skin. So the question is where are we taking it from? Well the things that we don't need when we're exercising is what we're going to take it from. So like our digestion and our filtration system. This is not what we need when we're in the middle of like exercising or if we're like go back to the olden days, think of like the fight or flight system whenever we're activating that sympathetic nervous system is to try and fight off that saber tooth tiger. Well, we don't need to be filtering our kidneys and digesting our food when we are trying to run from this threat of harm or when we're trying to exercise. So we're going to take blood away from the kidneys, away from the abdomen, away from the digestive system, and reroute those to the skin, the skeletal muscle, and the heart. So blood pressure, remember we're looking at, it's the pressure in the systemic arteries, right? So it's the pressure on the walls that's exerted by the blood on the wall of the blood vessel, specifically the arteries, right? So that's where our, our blood pressure is. There's four major components or variables that affect what our blood pressure is. And remember, blood pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury. And those four different components are the heart rate, the stroke volume, 
the blood volume and the total peripheral resistance. So heart rate is obviously just how many beats per minute the heart is beating. Stroke volume is that amount of blood that is being pumped out of the heart from the left ventricle. It also can have one on the right ventricle too, but it's the going out of the left ventricle during one contraction of the heart. Blood volume is just looking at the amount of blood that we have within the system. And then the total peripheral resistance is essentially like that vasoconstriction that's further down the line in the blood vessels. So it's like how much resistance is there as it's trying to pump out towards the rest of the body. An increase in any of these four variables will increase blood pressure. All right, it will increase blood pressure. And so one of the ways we can actually calculate blood pressure is taking what's called our cardiac output times our total peripheral resistance. And our cardiac output is simply our heart rate times our stroke volume. So it's the amount of blood that's leaving the heart each minute. So if we take that cardiac output, multiply it by the resistance that's there, that is what actually gives us our blood pressure. So as blood is leaving the heart and traveling into the aorta, it is under the largest range of pressures. We have a lot of pressure that is occurring during systole, the systolic blood pressure, which is when the heart is actually pumping, versus our diastolic pressure, which is what is happening, what is the pressure on the arterial walls when the heart is rested. So that is gonna completely alternate. We're gonna find out both of those values as you guys were looking at in lab. As we move from the larger arteries moving down the line to the arteries to the arterioles you'll notice that we start to get a drop in pressure and as soon as we hit those small arterioles which is really where a lot of control has for our blood pressure because there's a lot of vasoactive properties and smooth muscle in our arterioles this heading into the capillaries and diffusing, and remember that vascular bed that we were looking at going in all of those areas, that's where we're gonna lose our pressure. Think of it like if you had a raging river that was traveling down with a lot of pressure and speed behind it, and all of a sudden it opens up into a lake. And all of a sudden when you look at the surface of the lake, you notice that the slow, it, the flow is slower and there's not as much pressure coming behind it because it's opened up to a larger space. Well, the capillaries, although they're smaller in diameter, they take up a huge cross-sectional area. And so what ends up happening is it like acts like that lake where everything just slows down in there and we lose a lot of pressure. And then as things start to you know, come back into the venules, into the veins, into the vena cava, we're really looking at a drop in pressure, usually only around around five or so millimeters of mercury. So it's a very low pressure in our veins, very high pressure in our large arteries and then moving into our arteries, our conduit arteries as well. So just a little bit of our blood pressure terminology. Um, we've looked at uh, hypertension already a little bit, but it is related to an increase in that peripheral resistance. So it's how much resistance the heart is pumping against. And we know that we're defining our hypertension as a systolic blood pressure over four, 140 millimeters of mercury and or a diastolic blood pressure over 90 millimeters of mercury. We can also go on the other side of things and have what's called hypotension. Hypo is not enough and the tension is that pressure. So a low level of blood pressure is when our systolic um, is below 100 millimeters of mercury. And that's more of a concern if it's not always underneath 100 millimeters of mercury. So for instance, that's one of the things that we're gonna be looking at when we start looking for signs of shock is a drop in blood pressure. And we start to become worried when that blood pressure is dropping below 100 millimeters of mercury for the systolic blood pressure. Now, sometimes our body is not compensating very well for things that are happening to it, and that can affect how quickly our um, blood pressure can respond to when we move, say, from like a laying down position to a standing up position. When this happens and our body is not responding really quickly because our autonomic nervous system is not firing or it's not reading those signals very quickly or just isn't as responsive, this is what is called orthostatic vital signs. So it's a case in which when you go from laying down 
And when you stand up, you get a significant drop in blood pressure, which is just indicating that the body is not responding well to whatever it is going through at the time. All right, so we're gonna take a break from arteries, veins, and capillaries for just a moment and talk about the other type of vessels that we have within our body, which is lymph. So I've got an awesome video for you guys to watch. Lymph means clear water in Latin, and it describes the fluid that flows through the lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes, which make up the lymphatic system. The three major roles of the lymphatic system, the reason we need it in the first place, are that it returns fluid from the tissues back to the heart, it helps large molecules like hormones and lipids enter the blood, and it helps with immune surveillance to keep infections from running amok. So let's take a closer look at lymph and where it comes from. The blood in the arteries is under a lot of pressure because it needs to reach every little nook and cranny of the body. Those arteries branch out into narrower and narrower arteries, and then arterioles until finally it gets to the capillaries, which have walls that are only one cell thick and are slightly porous. Red blood cells are too big to fit through the capillary pores, but small proteins like albumin and fluid can make it through. Every day, 20 liters of fluid, water, and protein seep out of the capillaries and becomes part of the interstitial fluid between the cells. About 17 liters gets quickly reabsorbed back into the capillaries, but that leaves around three liters of fluid behind in the tissues each day. This three liters of fluid needs to find a way back into the blood so that the body's interstitial fluid volume and blood volume both stay constant over time. That's where the lymphatic vessels, or just lymphatics, come into play. They collect excess interstitial fluid and return it to the blood. Once the interstitial fluid is in the lymphatic vessels, it's called lymph. You might be wondering how there can be 20 liters of fluid seeping out each day if the blood volume is only five liters. Well, remember that the five liters is constantly in motion and that it gets recycled over and over every single day. Unlike the circulatory system, the lymphatic system isn't a closed loop because fluid and proteins make their way into the microscopic lymphatic capillaries and all of the collected lymph is dumped into the veins. Lymphatic capillaries are the smallest lymphatic vessels and they're located throughout the interstitial space. Lymphatic capillaries are extremely permeable because their walls are made of endothelial cells that only loosely overlap, forming one-way mini valves. These endothelial cells are anchored to structures in the interstitial space by collagen filaments, which allows the lymphatic capillaries to stay flexible but retain their overall shape. When the pressure in the interstitial space is greater than the pressure in the lymphatic capillary, the endothelial mini valves open up allowing fluid to get in. When the pressure in the interstitial space is less than the pressure in the lymphatic capillary, the endothelial mini valves are pushed shut, which keeps the lymph inside. Once that lymph is inside the lymphatic capillaries, it travels through bigger and thicker walled vessels, then trunks, and then ducts. There's no pump pushing lymph through the lymphatic system. Instead, smooth muscle in the lymph vessels reacts to the pulsing of nearby arteries by squeezing to get things started. And then the squeezing of skeletal muscles, which normally contract throughout the day, exert external pressure to keep the lymph flowing along, eventually reaching a nearby lymphatic trunk. To keep the lymph from sliding backwards, the lymphatic vessels have valves just like the veins do. Lymphoid organs remove foreign material from the lymph to keep it from entering the bloodstream and act as lookout points for the body's immune defenses. Some lymphoid organs are in the form of diffuse lymphoid tissue, where they're just a loose arrangement of lymphoid cells and protein, typically in the lining of the gastrointestinal and respiratory tract. Another type of lymphoid organs are lymph nodes, which are tightly packed balls of lymphoid cells and protein. Hundreds of lymph nodes cluster along the lymph vessels, each one a few millimeters to about one to two centimeters in size. When they're concentrated along the lymph trunks, you can feel them, especially in the neck, armpit, and groin. They can also be found in the intestinal wall, where they're called Peyer's patches. Another lymphoid organ is the spleen, 
which is about the size of a fist and sits on the left side of the body below the diaphragm and on top of the stomach. The spleen has both white pulp and red pulp. The white pulp is where antibody-coated bacteria are filtered out of the circulation and antibodies are generated by B cells. In a sense, the white pulp of the spleen is like a giant lymph node. Although unlike a lymph node which receives unfiltered lymphatic fluid, the spleen receives blood. The red pulp of the spleen is where old and defected blood cells are destroyed. And their parts, which are the hemoglobin, the heme chain, and the iron, are either broken down or recycled. The spleen is also helpful in that it keeps red blood cells and platelets available in case they're suddenly needed by the body. Really, it's an organ that's got your back in an emergency. A final set of lymphoid organs worth mentioning are the tonsils, which include the adenoid, tubal tonsils, palatine tonsils, and lingual tonsils. Together, they form a ring of lymphoid tissue around the throat, and their main job is to trap pathogens from the food you eat and the air you inhale. All right, as a quick recap, the lymphatic system refers to the one-way network of lymphatic vessels that allows lymph, which is a clear fluid that's squeezed out of the blood, to transport nutrients to cells and act as a method of waste removal. Lymph is cleansed at lymph nodes throughout the lymphatic system, which play an important role in immune function. All right. So let's now talk a little bit more about bleeding and shock. So there's different types of external bleeding that we can have. We can damage an artery, we can damage veins, or we can damage capillaries. And what we're gonna see is gonna be a little bit different. We'll treat bleeding the same, but as far as like what we're gonna see with each one of these different things, let's go over that. So arteries, remember, travel from the heart to out towards the body. The blood is freshly oxygenated, so it's bright red in color, and it's under a high amount of pressure, which means literally if you are cutting into an artery, um, you are going to see blood spurting and pumping with each pulse of the heart. That's how you know it is an artery that is damaged. That's different than the veins. Remember, veins are traveling from the body back to the heart. It's deplete of oxygen, so it's a darker red in color. And instead of the pumping action that we see with the arteries, you're just gonna see a steady flow of blood. The larger the vein, the more blood that's gonna be flowing. Now remember, capillaries are what join these two together. Um, blood is in the process of depleting of oxygen because it's dropping off oxygen and picking up waste products. It does tend to be darker red in color and instead of like a steady flow or the pumping action that we see with the veins and the arteries, it's like a slow oozing that actually typically pl um, clots on its own. Think of it like when you were a kid um, and you got road rash um, after falling off your bike or when you were roller skating or say you're sliding into home plate and you get that like roughed up area and then all of a sudden it starts to like ooze and then it ends up clotting all on its own. That's what the capillary bleeds look like. There's different classes that we have of bleeding. Class one bleeding is when you have a, a percentage loss of blood between zero and 15%. Usually there's not a whole lot of complications. Their heart rate might be elevated just a little bit. So tachycardia, fast heart rate. But our vital signs really aren't changing much more beyond that. Um, and this is typically what we'll see with people who just donated blood. So it's not something that is um, hugely an issue. Um, they just might have a heart fast heartbeat, but nothing else is really causing problems. So then we move on to class two bleeding, a loss of about 15 to 30 percent of your blood volume. So we will see tachycardia, a fast heart rate above 100 beats per minute. Remember that our average blood um, heart rate is between 60 and 100 um, as far as a normal range. Once we start getting above 100 is when it's, we consider it tachycardia. The respiratory rate is also elevated. So we'll see that change in the vital sign. When we look at their skin, instead of being pink, warm, and dry, they're gonna look um, 
uh, it's going to be pale in color as well as cool to the touch. We're trying to redirect blood flow to the surface of the skin and pull it back into circulation in order to heal what's ever going on or to replenish the, the blood volume that we're losing. Um, and so as that is being pulled away, so does the temperature go away from the skin. So that's why it's cool to the touch. And then when we pull our shunt our blood away from the skin towards the core of our body, it also loses the ability to regulate the moisture of the skin. So it'll feel clammy to the touch. So it's like wet, almost sweaty. They'll also be experiencing anxiety and we can even maybe see it in these people, in these patients. A drop in the pulse pressure, which is that difference between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure, is a result of an increase in catecholamines like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and an increase in our total peripheral resistance and a subsequent increase in blood pressure. So we'll see a slight increase in blood pressure. We're gonna walk through the physiology of that in just a moment um, in our class two bleeds. Going further, a loss of a blood volume around 30 to 40%, we're looking at a class three bleed. It has a, a significant increase in respiratory rate and heart rate with a drop in blood pressure and a drop in urinary output. So we don't need to be getting rid of volume through our urine, so we're actually gonna retain that. We'll get level of consciousness changes as well. So they might start to become a little bit more drowsy. Um, the smallest amount of blood loss, this is the smallest amount of blood loss that consistently causes hypotension. So this is the one that we'll start to see when we start getting up to like 30 to 40 percent is when we'll actually see a drop in our blood pressure. These often require blood transfusions after the bleeding is controlled, um, but that can be decided based on how well they respond to just putting fluids in the system instead of just blood. So maybe if we just stick it um, saline into the bloodstream and act as increasing the volume, that might be okay without having to add actual whole blood in. And then finally, we have our class four bleeds, which may have a loss of greater than 40% of our blood volume. You get an extremely high heart rate, a drop in that blood pressure, the narrowing of the pulse pressure, um, which is that difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. Essentially, we will not have urinary output at all during this time period. A drop of level in consciousness, perhaps maybe leading into like unconsciousness, um, and very cold, pale skin as we have taken blood away from the skin, rerouted it to the core of the body. And here we are at immediately life-threatening issues, right? We have lost a tremendous amount of blood and we need to seek help immediately. They'll need blood transfusions after we can actually fix whatever the problem is. So I know we talked about, uh, we're, we're talking about the treatment of how do we actually control for bleeding covered in the lab. There are two articles um, that are posted for you to be able to read that kind of just highlight a few things um, within the EMS system. And one thing I just want to make sure to point out to you is what direct pressure is. This picture that's shown here, most people believe that that is direct pressure. But what we are finding in the field is that putting like the palm of your hand in squeezing is really still too diffuse of pressure, meaning it's too spread out and actually isn't stopping the bleeding. What we really need is pinpoint pressure on exactly where that opening to the skin or to the artery is. And so we really want like digital aimed a direct pressure, if that makes any sense. And you'll see that as you go and you read in the articles that are posted for you guys. Internal bleeding. So what are signs and symptoms of internal bleeding? Well, you can see bruising underneath the skin. It'll feel tender to the touch. Um, instead of being soft and pliable, especially like in the stomach area, when you go to press on it, it'll feel very rigid. Um, if it's on an appendage, you'll actually look and see swelling in that area where the blood is congregating underneath the skin. 
Um, it basically, we've got ruptured blood vessels that are just not rupt, not um, through a wound in the skin, so that's not able to come out, and it's just collecting in that space underneath the skin. We're also going to see signs and symptoms of shock, which is like nausea and vomiting, dizziness, lightheadedness, pale, cool, and clammy skin. So that's what we're going to see in our signs and symptoms to find out if we're looking at a case of internal bleeding. And as far as the treatment for internal bleeding, is really all we can do is treat for shock and get them transported so that we can take care of things through surgery if needed. That's not, I think, nothing that we can do in the field other than treat for shock, which is a tremendous help. So let's talk about shock. Hypo perfusion. Hypo is not enough. Perfusion is the oxygenation of the tissue. So that's what we call shock, hypo perfusion, shock interchangeable. So it's inadequate perfusion, which is the oxygenation of tissue through the blood flow at the cellular level. So cells are not getting enough oxygen because we don't have enough blood flow or, blood flow or oxygen within the system. Everyone who dies, dies from shock. Everyone. So on the you know, report, it might say gunshot wound to the chest but really they're dying from shock, hypovolemic shock. They might say died of a heart attack. Yes, but it's actually the shock is what, what killed them, the inability to pump oxygen around to our cells, and it happens to be cardiogenic shock because that's what it was caused by, was from the heart, right? There's several different types of shocks that we have, but everyone who dies actually dies from shock. It's just a matter of where it's coming from. So the three different things that contribute to our cardiovascular system that we can have problems with is the pump, the container, and the fluid. The pump would be the heart, the container would be the blood vessels, and the fluid is our blood itself. So when we look at this, we're really looking at the different types of shock correspond with issues with either the pump, the container, or the fluid. So for instance, cardiogenic shock is affected by the heart, not being able to circulate oxygen and blood around. The container system, if it's got massive vasodilation and we're not able to keep, um, it's just too wide and open and we're not controlling our blood pressure well, that we'll see in neurogenic shock, septic, septic shock, and anaphylactic shock. And then if we're losing too much volume, of blood and we just don't have enough blood, that's when we're gonna see it as hypovolemic shock because of the lack of fluid. So I've got a video, this one's a little bit long, longer for you to be able to watch, but it's gonna walk through some of the types of shock. So when we talk about ischemia, we're usually talking about this lack of blood flow to a specific area of tissue. So maybe like with a heart attack, a coronary artery in the heart gets blocked that supplies the left ventricle with blood. So that localized area of heart tissue doesn't get enough blood and oxygen, and that damage is localized to that left ventricle. Shock is like ischemia, but on a global scale. In other words, it's a whole body circulatory failure, where blood flow to tissues is dangerously low, leading to cellular injury, possibly damaging multiple organs, and even leading to multiple organ failure if not treated immediately. Okay, so with shock, the body's tissues aren't getting enough oxygen via the blood, right? Normally, blood perfuses through tissue and delivers oxygen because there's enough pressure in the circulatory system to push it through. So blood pressure is a major determinant for the amount of blood perfusing through tissues. Now, blood pressure is determined by two components, the resistance to blood flow in the blood vessels, things like vessel length, blood viscosity, and vessel diameter, and the cardiac output, which is the volume of blood pumped by the heart through the body per minute. And you can break that into heart rate, the number of beats per minute, times stroke volume, the amount pumped out each beat. Going even further, the stroke volume is found by taking the total volume of blood left over after contraction, the end systolic volume, and subtracting it from the total volume in the heart after filling, the end diastolic volume. All right, now keeping all those in mind, shock can be caused by a whole bunch of different things but we can categorize the different types of shock into three main categories, along with some subcategories here and there. The first category is called hypovolemic shock. Hypo means low, vol refers to volume, and emia refers to the blood. So hypovolemic shock is shock induced by a low fluid volume of blood. And this could be either non-hemorrhagic or hemorrhagic. 
Non-hemorrhagic means that the loss of fluid volume isn't from bleeding. So this could be like if you were stranded in a desert and suffered severe dehydration. Eventually, your loss of fluid and sweat would reduce blood volume to where it wouldn't be enough to supply your body's organs, and you develop hypovolemic shock. Hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock, on the other hand, is loss of blood volume through ruptured blood vessels, in other words, from bleeding. A loss of about 20% of your total blood volume, roughly one liter, can be enough to induce hypovolemic shock. And when that liter of blood leaves the circulation, the total volume filling into the heart goes down, meaning the end diastolic volume goes down, right? This means stroke volume goes down as well, which causes cardiac output to go down, and finally we see that blood pressure goes down. When cardiac output goes down, catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine ADH and angiotensin II are released, all of which cause vasoconstriction of blood vessels, which increases vascular resistance and increases heart rate, which increases cardiac output. And these combined effects all increase blood pressure. A super important indicator of tissues not getting enough oxygen due to hypovolemia is a decreased mixed venous oxygen saturation, or MVO2. MVO2 is the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin in blood coming to the right side of the heart from the tissues. So it's like the amount of oxygen left over or not extracted and used by the tissues. So if blood volume's down, that means oxygen's down and there's going to be less left over, right? So MVO2 will be down with hypovolemic shock. Since blood flow provides heat to the tissues as well, when it's down, the skin starts to feel cool and clammy. And so hypovolemic shock is considered a cold shock. A second main category of shock is cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic means produced by the heart, right? So this is when something happens to the heart such that now it can't pump enough blood to the body's tissues. The most common cause is acute myocardial infarction or heart attack. Hold on a second though. Didn't I say at the beginning that that was more along the lines of localized ischemia? Well, the heart attack itself reflects ischemia, right? But these effects of the initial cardiac damage eventually leads to a state of shock. When the heart's muscle cells die, it can't contract as hard, which means the amount of blood pumped out, or stroke volume, goes down, and therefore cardiac output goes down as well. In the same way as with hypovolemic shock, the body releases vasoconstrictors to increase vascular resistance and help maintain blood pressure. Also, as with hypovolemic shock, MVO2 will be down since there's less oxygen being pumped out, and so less will be left over. Sometimes there might be an obstruction that doesn't allow the heart to fill properly with blood. For example, we might have the pericardial sac fill up with fluid from an infection or blood from a traumatic accident, like getting stabbed in the chest. If this sac fills up, it physically constricts the heart from expanding and contracting normally, and also reduces the stroke volume. This is sometimes subclassified as obstructive shock. But you can see that the cause is still due to the heart's inability to do its job, right? Similarly to hypovolemic shock, a reduction in cardiac output leads to lowered blood flow, so the skin gets cool and clammy, and so cardiogenic shock is also considered a kind of cold shock. All right, the third main category of shock is called distributive shock, where there's typically a leakiness of blood vessels and an excessive amount of arterial vasodilation, or widening of the peripheral blood vessels, which remember is one of the components of vascular resistance. If arterioles dilate, vascular resistance to blood flow goes down and blood pressure goes down, leading to less perfusion and distribution of blood to organs and tissues. Now the most common type of distributive shock is septic shock from pathogens in the blood. What happens with septic shock is endotoxins these large, clunky lipopolysaccharide molecules, sometimes just called LPSs, found in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria causes a crazy cascade of events that ultimately leads to lowered perfusion. First, these guys directly damage endothelial cells and cause them to release vasodilators like nitric oxide. They also activate the complement pathway in the blood, which stimulates mast cell release of histamine, another vasodilator. The LPS molecules also activate immune cells like macrophages and neutrophils, which help create a bunch of pro-inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1. These help the immune system destroy the invaders, but they also stimulate the endothelial cells to release more inflammatory molecules like platelet-activating factor and reactive oxygen species, 
all of these inflammatory chemicals damage the endothelial cells and increases their vascular permeability, making the blood vessels leaky. Also, endothelial cells express a procoagulant called tissue factor. Procoagulants are molecules that increase blood coagulation or blood clotting. And this, in combination with an overall decrease in anticoagulants, which usually decrease clotting and seem to be often depleted or used up during sepsis, leads to this net increase in coagulation and clotting in the microvasculature. And of course, clotting and blockages in the blood vessels further decreases perfusion, right? Okay, so this widespread vasodilation means very little vascular resistance. And blood can't get the chance to unload as much oxygen as it cruises through the vasculature. And it gets back to the right side of the heart with leftover oxygen. So in this case, as opposed to cardiogenic and hypovolemic shock, MVO2 can be normal or even increased. In contrast to hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock, now there's an increase in flow in the peripheral blood vessels, and the skin becomes warm and flushed. So distributive shock is a kind of warm shock. The overall combined effects of widespread vasodilation, increased vascular permeability, and microvascular blood clotting all contribute to decreased perfusion of blood to vital organs. Now, two kind of subtypes of distributive shock are anaphylactic shock, which is an allergic reaction that causes dangerously low blood pressure, and neurogenic shock, where the nervous system gets damaged and can't control the body's blood pressure. The treatment of shock depends on the cause. In general, the goal is to stabilize blood pressure so that vital organs like the heart and the brain are perfused with blood. In order to stabilize blood pressure, fluid replacement and medications that increase heart contractility, cause vasoconstriction, and retain fluid can be administered. Oftentimes, a person might need supplemental oxygen or have their airway protected, for example, with intubation. All right, as a quick recap, shock is ultimately a failure in tissue perfusion and it affects the whole body, putting tissues and organs at risk for injury and ultimately organ failure. Hypovolemic shock happens when dehydration or hemorrhage reduces the volume of blood in the blood vessels. Cardiogenic shock happens when a direct injury like a heart attack or an obstruction like a pericardial effusion prevents the heart from pumping blood efficiently. Distributive shock happens when something like an allergic reaction or damage to the nervous system, called neurogenic shock, causes the blood vessels to vasodilate and become leaky, which reduces the resistance and lowers the blood pressure. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in a deeper dive on- All right, so it talked to you in that video about hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, and distributive shock, and they then mentioned an obstructive shock and kind of put it underneath cardiogenic, but in reality, it is a whole nother classification of shock. Um, is obstructive shock. So I've got one more video here on shock that is talking about the types of shock, and this one's going to show you obstructive shock. Obstructive shock is very similar to cardiogenic shock, and that's actually why I have this heart drawn out right here. In cardiogenic shock, the problem is the heart is not able to squeeze properly and pump blood forward. In obstructive shock, it's actually very similar, except the issue here is it's an obstruction. There's an obstruction either surrounding the heart or in the blood vessels that prevents blood from being pumped forward. But because it's very similar, you can actually have very similar symptoms as you see in cardiogenic shock. For example, an obstruction can cause blood to back up into the lungs and into the right side of the heart. And of course, blood in the lungs can cause coughing and difficulty breathing due to all this accumulation of fluid in the lungs. It's known as pulmonary edema. As blood continues to back up, as we were showing, this fluid overload can cause an enlarged heart, cardiomegaly. Fluid continues to back up into the system, you might see something called JVD, jugular venous distension, as blood backs up into the neck. And if it's severe enough, blood can back up and cause global swelling throughout the body. This total swelling throughout the body is known as anasarca. So pulmonary edema, cardiomegaly, jugular venous distension, and anasarca, total body swelling, can all result from obstructive as well as cardiogenic shock. It's all signs of just fluid overload. Add in such signs as increased heart rate, tachycardia, and decreased blood pressure from the inability of blood to be pushed out of the heart, this hypotension 
and of course, decreased oxygen delivery to the system. So what can cause obstructive shock? Well, for that, let's go ahead and take a look down here. Here I've got four different hearts drawn out so that we can go over different types of obstruction. The first type I wanna go over is called cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is pressure created around the heart because of accumulation of fluid or blood in the pericardial sac. And what the heck's the pericardial sac? Well, it's actually a sac that the heart sits in that is lined with cells that produce a fluid that helps keep the heart frictionless as it beats. Because your heart's gonna be beating your whole life. So putting in this pericardial sac with a, an oil-like fluid allows for this decreased friction. Now the issue with pericardial tamponade is an overaccumulation of fluid. And this is known as a pericardial effusion. This effusion might occur, for example, let's say there's a tear in the ventricular wall of the heart. Blood's gonna start pouring out and as it starts pouring out, it just fills up the pericardial sac. And as the fluid continues to accumulate, it puts pressure on the heart. Because there's this fluid surrounding the heart, the heart can no longer expand. And so what you see is this area, these compartments of the heart end up becoming smaller because the heart is just so constricted. So when the heart does squeeze, it can't push that much blood out because there's not enough blood that can get into the heart. And also because of this increased pressure surrounding the heart, if blood is trying to get back from the venous system into the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava, trying to get back into the right atrium, not only is the compartment smaller, but because there's such a high pressure around the heart, the blood can't even get in there. Remember that fluids and gases tend to go towards lower pressure. I and mean, that's exactly how the heart functions. When it squeezes, pressure increases in the heart to push blood out. But now the trouble is there's too much pressure around the heart, so blood can never even get in through the blood vessels into the heart. So you have decreased venous return into the heart, along with decreased compartment size. So the ventricles and the atria are decreased in size, which decreases the amount of blood that can be pushed out of the heart, the stroke volume. Now cardiac tamponade, the fluid accumulation around the heart, is just one example that involves this pericardial sac. Another example is constrictive pericarditis. Constrictive pericarditis is when the pericardium gets very rigid. So rather than blood accumulating around the heart, the pericardium is putting the pressure directly on the heart. So the pericardium might become constricted because of infection, a lot of scarring occurs, something like that. But you get the same concept. Blood cannot be pushed out of the heart. Another example of obstructive shock is a tension pneumothorax. What's a tension pneumothorax? Tension pneumothorax is when you have air that leaks into the pleural cavity. But what's the pleural cavity? Pleural cavity is a space that includes your lungs and the heart. And this space is bordered by the diaphragm, the chest walls, which I've drawn on the lateral sides, and soft tissue and other things on the top side. Now this is really an oversimplification of the pleural space, but I just wanna give you an idea that it's really an enclosed space. Now the concept here is you again have an increase of pressure, but this time it's not just surrounding the heart, it occurs in the pleural space as well. So for example, let's imagine a patient has a stab wound. Let's say he got into a fight with somebody with a knife and they stabbed him. Let's say the chest wall acts as a one-way valve and air is able to get into the pleural space, but it cannot escape. With each deep breath that the patient takes, not only are they drawing air into their lungs through their trachea, but also air is getting pulled into the space around their lungs. This causes all of the organs to shift over, away from this air in the pleural cavity, also known as the thoracic cavity. So this is a pneumothorax, air in the thoracic cavity. And it's causing all of this tension as it pushes all of the organs to the side, including the lungs, the heart, and the trachea. So this causes constriction on the heart. And just like we saw before over here, blood can't get into the heart because there's a higher pressure. And so blood is not able to really break this pressure barrier. So similarly to tamponade and, and constricted pericarditis, you have decreased venous return and constriction of the heart. Next, 
is a pulmonary embolism. Now let's say a patient falls and breaks their leg and their leg is put in a cast to immobilize it. So this immobilization may actually cause blood to clot because it doesn't move as well back to the heart. So blood in one of the deep veins of the leg may clot. So that's a deep vein clot, also known as a deep vein thrombosis, which we also like to call a DVT, deep vein thrombosis, in the medical community. So this DVT may potentially break off, and when a clot breaks off, it's known as an embolism. So it embolizes, and you can see that it can fit in the heart, but it gets stuck in the lungs, in the pulmonary arteries. And if it's a big enough clot, it can be so severe that when the heart tries to pump, blood from the right side of the heart can't really make it to the left lung. So blood can only go to the right lung in this case. So only one pulmonary vein is returning blood to the heart. So only so much blood can be squeezed back out to the brain, as well as to the organs and other parts of the body. The final obstruction that I'll talk about is stenosis, aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis is narrowing. Stenosis means narrowing. So this is narrowing of the aortic valve. So here's the aortic valve. It actually has three leaflets. And in your entire life, these leaflets are going to open and close, allowing blood to be processed through the heart. Now, as a patient ages, calcium that's in the blood may start to get stuck on these valves. This little yellowish orange is calcium depositing on the valves. This causes the valves not to be able to open and close quite so smoothly. And in fact, deposition can get so bad that it really narrows the valve. So you can see, when, even when the valve tries to open, there's only really a small area that blood can pass through. So if it's severe enough, it can cause obstructive shock. So what sort of labs would you want to get for a patient who has obstructive shock? First of all, you want to get your typical lab values, such as a serum lactate or an ABG, arterial blood gas. So this allows you to, so these are your typical values that you'll get in any sort of shock. But you also maybe want to get other laboratory and diagnostic tests that can help you diagnose an obstructive shock. So I won't go into too much detail, but the idea here is you want to use tests that will help you diagnose these specific conditions. So for example, cardiac tamponade and constrictive pericarditis, you might want to use an ultrasound of the heart, an echocardiogram. In the case of tamponade, for example, it can show you that there's blood or fluid accumulation around the heart. For something like attention pneumothorax, maybe getting an x-ray will help you diagnose this disease. Or better yet, there's a clinical way to diagnose. So I want you to go ahead and, and feel your throat. Now when you feel, you can tell it's in the middle for you. However, in a patient who has attention pneumothorax, it might be deviated towards one side or the other. So for example, if a patient has a right tension pneumothorax, as we see here, the trachea is going to be pushed along with all the other organs and be deviated to the left side of the patient. So a clinical observation like that can help you save a patient's life because you can immediately diagnose and treat the patient. So what should we do to treat obstructive shock? The major way to treat obstructive shock is to relieve the obstruction. Relieving the obstruction can actually stop the shock altogether very quickly. So for example, in attention pneumothorax, once diagnosed, you can treat immediately with needle thoracostomy. What needle thoracostomy is, is, is insertion of a hollow tube into the chest wall. And that allows all this air that is accumulated to escape out and release the tension in the thoracic cavity. If aortic stenosis is the problem, maybe a new valve, known as a valvuloplasty, is required. Pulmonary embolism, dissolving this embolus or removing it directly by guiding a catheter into the heart and grabbing hold of this embolism. And for something like tamponade, you can stick a needle into this pericardial cavity and draw out the fluid. So treatment of obstructive shock relieve the obstruction. All right, so that gave us the look of obstructive shock. When it talked about the treatments, keep in mind those are ultimate treatments that need to be done. It's not necessarily the things that we are gonna be able to do at our level. Um, and that actually gave you a preview to some of our chest injuries that we are going to look at. 
um, in the next week or so. So I've got one more video for you guys that's going to delve into the physiology of what happens when we start compensating for when we're heading into shock. So we're going to watch this one. It does, it, it's really quick. And as far as like, it talks really quickly um, and goes into a lot of detail, but don't be afraid to stop, rewind, pause, whatever you need to do. And then we'll kind of come back at the end and do a summary together. Armando Hasurigan, biology and medicine videos. Please make sure to subscribe, join the forum and group for the latest videos. Please visit Facebook, Armando Hasurigan. In this video, we will look at the autonomic nervous system's response to shock. Shock is basically when the body, when the body tissues and organs are not receiving enough blood. Shock is characterized by a sudden drop in blood pressure. What we have to understand is that there are many types of shocks. They are the same in that the result is a decrease in blood pressure and also that there is not enough blood supply to body tissues and organs. In this video, we will focus on cardiogenic shock, which is essentially shock caused by the heart failing to pump blood around the body, which means that there is not enough blood being received by uh, body tissues and organs. This heart failing to pump blood out is most often due to myocardial ischemia. This is where the heart itself is not receiving enough oxygen, is not receiving enough blood. Let's take a closer look at myocardial ischemia first. So here we have the blood vessels that supplies the heart, called the coronary artery. The coronary artery supplies the cardiac muscle cells with blood. So here we have the red blood cells that carry oxygen. And so if we have a plaque forming in the coronary artery, there is a block in blood flow. And so little to no blood is reaching these cardiac muscle cells, resulting in ischemia. Myocardial ischemia can lead to muscle cell death because these muscle cells are not receiving any blood supply, any nutrients or energy. Therefore, if the muscle cells die in the heart, we have pump failure. And the heart is then unable to pump blood around the body resulting in a decrease in blood pressure. Shock also means that there will be not enough blood supplying tissues and organs around the body. So there will be a decrease in oxygen and other nutrients supplying body tissues. Your body cells will begin to shift then from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism because it is not receiving any oxygen, any red blood cells due to um, the drop in blood pressure and the uh, failing of the heart to pump blood to the tissues. Anaerobic metabolism will result in an increase in lactic acid production. After a while, an increase in lactic acid will lead to acidosis, which is harmful and dangerous for the body. Now, because the body's tissues are not receiving enough oxygen, there will also be a decrease in ATP production. Why? Well, because oxygen is important in creating or producing a lot of ATP. With a decrease in ATP production, cells will and can die due to no available energy. So there is cell necrosis. Also, in shock, because the cells are not receiving enough blood, and because there's bad blood flow, you have an accumulation of carbon dioxide, waste, essentially. Carbon dioxide can actually react with water in the body to form hydrogen ions and uh, carbonate. This is a normal physiological process. But if you have so much carbon dioxide, there will be a lot of hydrogen ions being produced, contributing or leading to acidosis, which as I mentioned, is very harmful for the body. Okay, so those are some of the problems that can arise with shock. And this also means um, cardiogenic shock. So let's go back to the heart, which is suffering from ischemia 
So before we can see what the body tries to do in order to uh, compensate for this problem, for this drop in blood pressure and this bad blood supply, we need to know some ana an anatomical structures in the heart. The aorta, which leaves the left ventricle, forms an arch called the aortic arch. The first artery that branches off the aortic arch is the brachiocephalic artery, which then divides to form the right subclavian artery and the right common carotid artery. The right common carotid artery then branches on again. The second artery that comes uh, from the aortic arch is the left common carotid artery, which then branches into two. The third artery that comes off the aortic arch is the left subclavian. Another important uh, thing to note are the nodes that actually um, orchestrate the pumping of the heart. They form part of the conduction system. So these nodes, these guys, essentially are the ones that stimulate the heart to keep pumping. Now, again, the left ventricle here normally pumps blood to the rest of the body through the aorta. But because this heart in particular is failing on the left side due to ischemia here, it can't pump that much blood out of the heart. When the heart can't pump much blood out, it means there is a decrease in what's called cardiac output. A decrease in cardiac output means a decrease in mean arterial pressure, which is pressure in the arteries. Now, because there is not much pressure, this will cause a decrease in baroreceptor firing. So what does this mean? Well, we have these special receptors called the baroreceptors. These baroreceptors are stretch receptors, and we can find them here. Here, they are called the aortic arch baroreceptors, and here, they are called the carotid sinus baroreceptors. So baroreceptors are stretch receptors. When there is a lot of pressure, these receptors are stretched, and so they are stimulated, and therefore they will fire many signals, essentially. But when there is a decrease in pressure, such as what we see in shock, the baroreceptors won't stretch as much, and so they are not stimulated, and so they won't fire as much signals, essentially. And what does this mean? Well, coming off these baroreceptors, there are sensory nerves. There is one sensory nerve called the vagus nerve, which receives information from the aortic arch baroreceptor. And it will send this information to the medulla oblongata, which is a region in the brainstem here. And then there is another sensory nerve that receives information from the carotid sinus baroreceptors called the glossopharyngeal nerve. And this will also send information, the signals, to the medulla as well. So the medulla oblongata is a super important place because within the medulla, there is a cardioregulatory and vasomotor sensor. And we will learn more about it soon. So here we are zooming into the section of a medulla. Here we have a cross section. In this section of the medulla oblongata, we have the cardioregulatory center, which is made up of the cardioinhibitory center and the cardioaccelatory center. So here, and they're they're even on both sides. So we have a, you know, on this side we also have a cardioinhibitory center. So let's step away from this diagram and just try to understand what the body will try to do when there is a decrease in baroreceptor firing due to a decrease in mean arterial pressure. So the goal is to increase mean arterial pressure. So when there's a decrease in baroreceptor firing, two things will occur in the medulla. First is that there will be 
uh, activation of the cardio accelerator center and vasomotor center. And at the same time, there will be an inhibition or inactive or uh, unactivation of the cardio inhibitory center. Now, the cardio accelerator center is the sympathetic nervous system. The cardio inhibitory center is the parasympathetic nervous system. So when there is a when the a cardio inhibitory center is not activated, there will be a decrease in parasympathetic activity. And so there will be a decrease in vagus nerve activity because the vagus nerve is the main nerve of the parasympathetic nervous system. So normally, coming out of the cardio inhibitory center here in the medulla, we have the vagus nerve, the motor vagus nerve that travels from the medulla to the conduction system of the heart. And the aim of the motor vagus nerve is to slow the heart rate down. But we don't want to do this. So therefore, the sensory neurons that are coming to the medulla from the baroreceptors will actually inhibit the cardio inhibitory center. So it will inhibit the motor vagus nerve from uh, working essentially. At the same time, this decrease in baroreceptor firing will stimulate the cardio accelerator center. This means that it will stimulate the sympathetic nerve activity. And there is a there are few there is an early um, uh, there is an early and late response. The early response is that the sympathetic nerve will try to increase the heart rate. And also, it will try. It will stimulate the release of uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline from the adrenal glands to cause vasoconstriction. So let's look at this at a diagram uh, to try to understand what's happening. So these baroreceptors, uh, these baroreceptor nerves that are uh, coming to the medulla, will at, will inhibit the cardio inhibitory center. But at the same time, it will stimulate the cardio accelerator center. So it will stimulate the sympathetic nerves. The sympathetic nerve will travel down the spinal cord to the thoracic uh, spine, and then it will go out from the spinal cord. It will synapse with another neuron in the sympathetic ganglion. This post-sympathetic neuron will then travel to the conduction system of the heart and will stimulate the conduction system of the heart to, to increase in heart rate. And therefore, an increase in heart rate will uh, cause an increase in cardiac output to increase mean arterial pressure. At the same time, the neurons, there are neurons uh, in another region of the thoracic, another sympathetic uh, neuron in the thoracic that will essentially go out and stimulate the adrenal glands which are found above the kidneys it will stimulate the adrenal medulla of the adrenal glands to secrete two important hormones adrenaline and noradrenaline adrenaline and noradrenaline will bind on receptors on veins and arteries it will bind on alpha receptors on veins and arteries to cause vasoconstriction. It will cause vasoconstriction to the arteries and veins all over the body except in the heart and brain because it wants blood to flow to these areas. So what does vasoconstriction do? Well, vasoconstriction will cause an increase in total peripheral resistance and therefore it will increase uh, lead to an increase in mean arterial pressure because we want to increase mean arterial pressure right so going back to this small mind map we have the early response of the sympathetic activity which is increase in heart rate and also a uh, release of noradrenaline and adrenaline to cause vasoconstriction and then we have a mid to late response. In the mid to late response, we have 
an increase in renin production as well as an increase in aldosterone uh, production. So what, are, what do these two molecules do? Well, going back to our spinal cord and sympathetic neurons, sympathetic neurons can travel down again to a region of the thoracic. Um, the sympathetic neuron will synapse with another neuron in the sympathetic ganglion. This postsynaptic, uh, post-sympathetic neuron will uh, travel to the kidneys and it will cause uh, the kidneys, it will stimulate the kidneys to release an enzyme called renin. Now, what does renin do? Well, renin will travel in the blood. Renin is an important enzyme to increase blood pressure. How does it do this? Well, the liver produces a molecule called angiotensinogen, which is a precursor. Renin will convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 in the blood. Angiotensin 1 is not that cool. But angiotensin 1 can travel to the lungs, where there is a, a high percentage of enzymes known as angiotensin converting enzyme. So when angiotensin 1 goes, travels to the lungs, angiotensin 1 will convert to angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. Angiotensin 2 is a, such an important molecule in increasing uh, blood pressure. First of all, it stimulates thirst, which means that it will increase uh, blood volume, resulting in increasing blood pressure. It also stimulates vasoconstriction. It has, it, uh, if, there's, if there's so much angiotensin II being produced, it will also cause cardiac hypertrophy, which is long-term. But angiotensin II main function that is, that is very important is that it actually stimulates the adrenal glands. Well, actually, it will stimulate the adrenal cortex of the adrenal glands, the outer part, to release aldosterone, which is a hormone that will increase blood pressure. It does this by acting on the kidneys. Um, it, it's, it causes the kidneys to increase potassium secretion. In, so more potassium in urine, but it causes an increase in sodium reabsorption from, uh, from the nephrons. So an increase in sodium reabsorption means that more water is being absorbed, reabsorbed, which means that it will increase plasma volume, increasing blood pressure, which we want in shock. So there are all these responses occurring during shock from early to late stage. Another important thing uh, to mention would be that there is another um, uh, reflex, you can say, that the heart has, which is the chemoreceptive reflex. See, when there's a decrease in pH or there's a decrease in oxygen in the blood, and an increase in carbon dioxide in blood, this will stimulate the chemoreceptors, or, uh, which are situated where the baroreceptors are. When these chemoreceptors are stimulated, they will actually stimulate the respiratory uh, center, which will cause hyperventilation, so you breathe quicker. All right, so a couple of things I want to note to you guys. First of all, when he's talking about adrenaline and noradrenaline, he is actually, I'm gonna see if I can actually just. Situated where the baroreceptors are. Oh, okay, I'm gonna pause this just right here so we can take a look at it. Um, but what we're looking at with adrenaline and noradrenaline is, um, we're actually looking at epinephrine and norepinephrine. So he's from a different country and they often in other countries are referring to it as adrenaline and noradrenaline. 
However, we in the States call it epinephrine and it's the same thing. It's just the hormone that's in the neurotransmitters that are flowing through the body. Um, so we don't, you know, if you want to look at it this way, we don't actually have adrenaline rushes in the U.S. We have epinephrine rushes, if you want to say that. Um, the other thing that I want to note is, so a lot of this was review from what you guys have already done, talking about the baroreflex. But I wanted to tie in what's happening with the baroreflex when it comes to its role with shock. So when we get that drop, in cardiac output, we get a drop in pressure and it's going to activate that sympathetic nervous system and downregulate the parasympathetic nervous system. And it's going to do this through the baroreflex. And so we are going to be activating these things through the baroreflex. And then, so I loved the explanation that he went through to be able to walk us through the changes that are going to happen within the body. Now, he went into the kidney information, which I don't need you to know in as much depth, but I think it's good for us to understand that there is some short-term regulation that happens with the baroreflex. However, long-term to compensate, we actually have the kidneys are doing the work. And so when it comes to long-term blood pressure regulation and control, it's really the kidneys that are doing it. And that wonderful enzyme that he referenced of ACE, the angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, A-C-E, is comes into play when we start talking about hypertension because one of the things that it's doing is it's converting that angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 and that angiotensin 2 was what was stimulating our thirst center and leading to the production of aldosterone and also leading to vasoconstriction on its own. That all is increasing pressure, which is good when we're in shock. When we have hypertension, we would like to actually downregulate that process. So one of the medications that people can take when they are hypertensive is actually an ACE inhibitor, which inhibits the actions of ACE of converting that from angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. So I don't need you to know that whole process. I just wanted you to take a look and understand that the kidneys do help with that long-term blood pressure regulation and give you that precursor so that when we start talking about ACE inhibitors that you kind of know how it's acting within the system. So let's do a small little recap of what's happening in compensatory shock. So we see, we start, we, you know, are suffering from either hypovolemic, cardiogenic, neurogenic, distributive, obstructive shock, some kind of a shock. And we're starting to see that drop in blood pressure. What are, what are the things that our bodies are going to do to be able to compensate for that? Well, we are going to see that baroreflex initiated, increasing our sympathetic nervous system. So we get an increase in our heart rate and we get an increase in our vasoconstriction. He at the end also talked about how it's going to activate our respiratory centers in order to increase our respiratory rate. So now not only can we be beating blood around faster within our body, but we actually can add more oxygen to it, which is what we need to get around our body by breathing more rapidly as well. At this point though, when we're seeing that lack of volume moving around and that gets compensated by the increase in heart rate, the blood pressure actually ends up evening out or might even be a little bit higher. We're not starting to see that drop in blood pressure yet because we're compensating so well, hence compensatory shock. So our level of consciousness, Sympathetic system is engaged, so restless anxiousness that we're going to feel. Um, blood is now being shunted right through that vascular shunt we talked about earlier from the peripheries to the core of the body. So we're going to bypass some of those capillary beds to areas that aren't needed, such as the digestive system and the skin, and we're going to reroute that to the core of the body. So skin is going to, look, when we reroute that blood away from the skin, it's going to look pale or ashen in color. It's going to be cool to the touch because we've taken the heat away with the taking the blood away. And we've taken away the ability to control and maintain moisture so they'll become clammy or sweaty to the touch. It's coming away from the stomach, away from the digestive system. So when that happens, things don't like to sit in our digestive system. And if it's not going down with digestion, it makes it want to come up, which is why we start to exhibit nausea and vomiting potentially. Now here's the thing. We've got a slightly elevated heart rate 
which really is going to be below the 100, right? So we're not actually getting into tachycardia yet. A slight increase in our respiratory rate, but it's not like incredibly high. 12 to 20 is the average breathing rate for an adult. And we're still going to be underneath that 20. We're just going to be on the high side of it. Blood pressure is either the same or slightly elevated. They're a little anxious, but they also just got into an accident or had a heart attack, whatever the case is. They're looking a little pale, cool, and clammy and a little nauseated. These things are really, really hard to diagnose. However, our body is working with us right now. So this is the time period it is so important to treat for shock. We can't wait until they start to cycle down the drain to try and then treat for shock because then it's just too late. So our body is compensating. Let's emphasize that and work with it and treat it now. But we've got to watch for these signs and symptoms because it's so hard to diagnose. If left untreated and circle down further, they'll start to head into what's called decompensatory shock. So instead of, com uh, instead of compensating now, they are actually starting to wind down and break apart as far as like metaphorically within the body and a little literally as well. So we're going to see an increase in the heart rate. This is when it's going to go above the 100. So this is going to be our tachycardia. Our respiratory rate is also going to engage through the same system they just talked about on the video with the chemoreceptors. And it's going to increase above the 20, which is the average. Now we're getting a lot of vasodilation or potentially um, just a drop in blood pressure because of a loss of volume. And so our blood pressure is starting to drop at this point. Um, vasodilation would come for if it's a neurogenic shock. Um, we're going to see a drop in the level of consciousness. Is less brain, less oxygen is getting up to the brain. They're going to become more disoriented, irritable, combative. This is affectionately what we know as our DICs, D-I-C. And they're lightheaded. They're dizzy. They might even be letting it into fainting. Um, but they're grumpy at this point. They don't like what's going on. They don't feel good. And they're just getting less oxygen to the brain. We're still rerouting blood from the skin. So they're still looking pale, cool, and diaphoretic. That clamminess has now gone to profuse sweating, which is called diaphoresis. And we're pulling it away from the digestive system, that blood away from the digestive system. So we're going to see nausea and vomiting in these individuals as well. Now, at some point, and we don't necessarily know this point, we're going to move from decompensatory shock, which the only thing that can really fix decompensatory shock is by giving them added volume into their bloodstream, which is by doing like an IV. So we really want our paramedic partners to be on scene to be able to help us when individuals are starting to go into decompensatory shock. But at some point, they're going to switch over into irreversible shock. And we don't necessarily know when this happens, but let's take a look at some of the signs and symptoms. Instead of the elevated heart rate, it's now starting to drop, right? The systems are starting to shut down. The respiratory rate is also dropping at this point. Blood pressure is tanking way below 100 millimeters of mercury for the systolic blood pressure. Level of consciousness is dropped, leading to unresponsiveness. The skin color is still gray or ashen, perhaps even moving into cyanotic, which is that blue color, and maybe even a waxy look to it. And the sweating is actually stopping now. And the thing is, with irreversible shock, once you head into it, you will never fully recover. You essentially go into end organ failure. It'd be great if it was just the liver that was damaged. We can repair the liver. It'd be great if it was just the lungs because we could repair the lungs. But the problem is when we start losing oxygen to all of our organs, it's too much damage and it can't be recovered from. So once we've headed into irreversible shock, by noting that extreme drop in heart rate, drop in respiratory rate, drop in blood pressure, drop in level of consciousness, we might not be able to get them out. We might not, not be able to actually recover them. We're going to still try, right? We're still going to try because you never know if we're maybe catching it on the downswing and we, we can catch it in time, but we just got to be watching for this. Now, shock is going to progress, 
right? The easiest time for us to treat is during compensatory shock. So we've got to be doing that as soon as we possibly can. So what do we do for treatment of shock? Well, we're going to put them in the shock position, which essentially means we're going to lay them down. We're going to make sure that we can aid blood flow getting to the heart, to the brain, everything like that. We used to say we want to elevate their um, legs, but we found out that actually is causing more issues. So we're just going to keep them level on the ground. We would like to give them oxygen because one of the issues with hypoperfusion fusion is not enough oxygen. So we're going to give them supplemental oxygen and we're going to do this for a large scale delivery device. So either a non rebreather or a bag valve mask if they're not breathing on their own. And we're going to open that up to 10 to 15 liters per minute um, and make sure that we've got high flow oxygen to them. Part of what's happening is they're losing their temperature as well. So we want to maintain their temperature as much as they can since they're not doing it for themselves, which will only exacerbate things worse. So we're going to cover with them with a blanket, but keep in mind that we lose a lot of heat to the ground, especially here in Oregon when the ground is really cold around us. So make sure you're protecting underneath them as well to protect from ground um, heat loss to the ground. We would love to have fluid replacements, especially if they're heading into decompensatory shock. So make sure you've got advanced life support on the way if you don't have a paramedic partner working with you. And we need to immediately transport because really what we need to do for shock is we have to fix the underlying cause, whatever is going wrong with them. And they talked about this in the obstructive shock video, like whatever the obstruction is, we need to fix it. If it's a lack, if it's um, a hemorrhagic bleed, so they're bleeding out and they're hypovolemic shock, we need to get volume into them and we need to stop the bleeding, right? If it's something that's going on with the heart, like they're having a heart attack, we need to fix what's going on in order to help them get treated for shock. Because as much as we're putting them in the shock position and giving them oxygen, really, if we don't fix the underlying cause, it's just going to keep spiraling down. So just a last couple of things to think about as far as pitfalls go. Um, as we already talked about, we've got to be able to recognize it in the early stages because that's when it's the most easily reversible. So watch for it. Elderly patients have a harder time compensating. Their neurons are aging and they actually have myelin sheet that are starting to degradate, which is actually what helps our messages carry quickly from our central nervous system traveling out to the rest of the body. And so um, they're not able to respond as well. They don't vasoconstrict as well as we want them to. They can't speed up their heart as rate 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 as quickly as we would want them to. So we just got to watch for that in that elderly patients will turn into um, decompensatory shock really quickly. Also, if our patients are taking beta blockers, beta blockers work on the heart to limit the heart rate, which means we might not actually even see the increase in heart rate if our patients are on a beta blocker. So you can't just look at heart rate as your only cue. You've got to be looking at other things. Also looking at hypothermia. If they're already hypothermic and we're dealing with cold skin, we're not going to necessarily be able to see those changes in color and temperature as well. So we just have to watch for that. Um, and if we're still seeing shock progress, is there the chance that we missed some injuries? So go back, check over the body again, make sure you're looking at your patient from head to toe and finding out if there's anything else that can be going on if we're not able to turn them around. And then we just, as another note, we need to not rely on blood pressure alone. 30% um, of blood volume loss occurs before blood pressure will drop. That is a huge amount of blood volume loss. So we've got to be watching the heart rate, we've got to be watching the respiratory rate, and then looking for that skin color, temperature, and moisture to look at oxygenation to the skin. So I just wanted to thank you guys very much. I know I went through this really quickly and I spoke quickly. My hope is that you can go back, watch parts that you need to rewatch again, and make sure that you are caught up. I would normally go through this in class a lot um, slower, um, but we're on a video, so you guys have that ability to, to change that. So thank you so much for joining me and ask questions to any of the instructors if you need help.